Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. So you deploy a new feature of your app and then half of it breaks. You start looking through your logs and realizing that database schema change that you made, that's causing all your issues. Now you're really scrambling and realizing, well, can I roll back my code changes? Nope, the damage is already done. I now need to roll forward and fix everything as quickly as we possibly can. This could all kind of be managed if you're really dealing with your database migrations correctly and realizing that backwards compatibility is key. Now we wanna keep our app code and our database in sync, meaning that our app code understands what our database schema is. So that means that when we need to make a change to our database schema, typically what we're gonna do is we're gonna make that schema change first, then we're gonna deploy our new app code that matches that schema, that understands it. Now I said it's typical to make your schema change first, but that really depends on what type of database you're using. In this video, I'm gonna kind of give different examples with different types of databases. But let's say, for example, you're using a relational database. Well, if you need to make a schema change, let's say adding a column, well, you have options such as making it dullable or giving it a default value. And if you do that, your existing application and how it's coded doesn't care about that column, it's fine. Everything will just work the way it is. So that means if we've deployed our new schema changes and our version one of our app is totally fine with those changes on how we made them, that means that if we do deploy our new version and there's some type of issue that we really realize it's unrelated to schema changes, there's some bug in our code that's really kind of catastrophic here, this just allows us to roll back. We were already running this way when we made our schema change. Everything's fine. We can roll back. I'd like to thank Current for sponsoring this video. Current's an event-native data platform that feeds real-time business-critical data with historical context and fine-grained streams from origination to destination, enhancing data analytics and AI outcomes. For more on Current, check out the link in the description. Now let's say that we're fully in sync. Our schema changes were made, we have our app deployed, and it's fully in sync with that. But we might not be done actually here because let's say that column that we added, we added it as a nullable. But really, we don't want it to be nullable. We want to have some type of backfill script to populate it with a legit actual value because we couldn't really just give it a default value. We have to have some backfill for it. Well, we could kind of go through this same process, which is have a schema change, that makes it not null, and at the same time, part of the same transaction, backfills all the data. Then the same thing as we have our code changes that now don't need to deal with any null values because there was data beforehand that was gonna be null. Now our code can change where it's not dealing with null at all, and we're just kind of going through this cycle. But just, it's not necessarily always just kind of one change and backwards compatible. There may be steps to this where once you stabilize things, you know everything's good, you kind of make further changes to your schema and to your app code. If you're using an event stream and an event store, the exact same thing applies. You wanna be making it backwards compatible. So the same thing, I was adding a nullable column to a table with our event stream here, here's my event. Let's say it was something to do with a shipment for an order, this is our order ship event, and we wanna start capturing the carrier, uh, UPS, USPS, FedEx, DHL, et cetera. So we're adding this carrier ID that relates to that, and we're just making it nullable. It's the exact same thing. So we're gonna to have to be able to deal our code of the carrier ID being it there or not there when we deserialize our event stream, get our events out, or we could upcast it to figure out and fill out a value when we need so at runtime. The exact same thing applies whether you're using something like this, or let's say you're using a document store. It's the exact same thing. Maybe when you deserialize, that property's not there based off old data. Maybe you don't want to backfill it. You just deal with it as being nullable. Just make it backwards compatible. This becomes a lot more apparent when you're in a scaled out environment running multiple instances of your app and you do rolling deployments. So we're deploying a new version. Let's say one instance gets replaced, but at this point we have a version, our old version of the app running and the new version of the app running against our new schema. It's not until we roll everything out that we have everything running on that new version. So there's a point in time there, depending on how quickly you do your rolling deployment, where you have old versions and new versions running at the exact same time. So when do we make schema changes? Well, we know we decide there's benefits doing it before deploying our code changes, but where part of the deploy pipeline? Well, that depends on what type of database you're using and the schema change that you're making. When well, I alluding to event streams and event store, there really is no schema change to be made because it's all really defined in code. So you're just deploying your app code and you're making it backwards compatible or being able to upcast. If you're making something like a change to a relational database, well, the first is having your schema change and your app code deployed at the exact same time. That means that at app startup time of your app, it's making the schema change. Meaning we have our deployment here, we're deploying our new app, 
And at startup, before it actually even handles requests or does any actual work, it's the one making this, the schema change. After that's done, then it can proceed to actual handle requests. The issue here is in that scaled out environment with multiple instances running, we can have some concurrency issues as well as we have to do that check to make sure that our scheme is up to date every time the app starts up and is that overhead that you don't need. So that means that when we deploy our app, let's say the first instance gets deployed, let's say we're doing a rolling deployment here, it's gonna make the schema change. Then we deploy that separate instance for the second one, it just has to go and check. Do I need to make the schema change? No, because it's already done, sure. But we still have to do that every time our app starts up. And again, depending on your context, are you deploying a lot? Are you not deploying a lot? Uh, how many instances do you have? It may just be a lot of overhead. Now, of course, there's trade-offs with everything. That might actually be what you want because your app knows at startup what version it should be. Maybe you decide you have different health check rules saying, okay, if it's not at this version, bail out, don't even start up. It really depends on your context. But you can still achieve that same thing with kind of that health check, but still having the schema change process done independently. So that means when we do our deployment, we have a separate step, a part of the deployment that really is just doing that data migration. It's not a part of your app startup, completely separate. Once that's done, the next step, if it succeeds, is then to actually do your app deployment. So this could be your blue green, this could be rolling deployments, etc. but still as a separate kind of step of your deployment process is doing that schema change. And this is applicable regardless of what type of database you're using. Because for example, let's say you're using an event store and you have an event stream that you want to transition to in a new stream because you're going to transform into some of the existing events and it's append only, so we're going to create a new stream. We could be doing that a part of that deploy process. Same thing goes if you're using kind of a document store and you want to change the collection and you want to be mutating something in the collection, adding a new collection, you're gonna be moving stuff over. It's exactly the same thing. Depends on how your database deals with schema, but the same idea is making those schema changes, then deploying app code. And remember, this doesn't need to be a single step. It may be multi-step like my example at the very beginning. We make a change, we make everything backwards compatible, then we had to make a separate step to kind of clean everything up. It doesn't need to be a one and done where you do everything in a single step. Now, as for tooling, I've been using Flyway for probably over 10 years. It served all my needs related to any relational database changes. So here's a little example of how it works. So I have a MySQL database here. There's a customer table. I'm using this as a read model, part of projections for some events, and I wanna add a new column. So the first thing I'm actually gonna do is kind of initialize our Flyway and kind of set the baseline of what my schema looks like now. So I've got the Flyway CLI. I'm actually just gonna execute this to run our baseline. So I've got the command ready here. I'm just gonna execute with our connection string and then calling baseline. What this is actually gonna do is say it's successful and it created our schema table. So if I refresh over here, we can now see we have this Flyway schema history and that's what it's using internally to kind of keep track of which migration script is actually executed. So now what I wanna do is actually create a migration because that's what we wanna to do to our deployment in production. We wanna create a migration so that it can execute part of our deployment process. So what I'm actually gonna do now is I'm actually gonna create a new migration. I'm gonna call this V2 since V1 was our baseline and we're gonna do create column.sql. I'm just gonna paste in some code here, some SQL to add our column. I'm gonna save this. Now what we can actually do is, I'm just gonna go up here, is instead of calling baseline, I can call migrate. So this will be a part of our deployment process. We've created our migration script. Now when we execute this, now we can see that we've run to version two, create column. If I look at our database now, we can see we've created that column. So this would be a part of, as I was illustrating, your deployment process. Locally, when you're developing, you're making your changes, but you're creating these migration scripts that will be a part of your deployment. The key to database migrations is maintaining backwards compatibility, and it can be a multi-step process. It really is really fundamentally looking at your code, understanding the changes you're making, the changes of your schema, and making sure it's backwards compatible. That first step can be exactly that of non-breaking changes. Step two can actually be doing all that cleanup with backfills, changing code going forward, et cetera. But it really is just about maintaining backwards compatibility because you may be in a, pro a kind of a state where you have new versions deployed of the app code that works with the new schema, but you still may have old versions or if you need to roll back. And then you can push forward from there. And like I said, kind of step two, do more cleanup. But really the key and fundamental of this is really looking at your code and really understanding when you're making these schema changes, 
that you're maintaining backwards compatibility. And my favorite thing is reading your comments. So get in there and let me know what type of tooling you're using for database migrations, any pain you experience, what types of database you're using, and the tooling around those migrations. Get in the comments and let me know. And as always, if you like these topics around software architecture and design, and you feel there's really no place to kind of communicate with other people about this, you kind of feel like your own island, and you want some feedback about kind of different questions that you have, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server where you can chat and ask questions about to other software developers that are kind of like-minded around these topics. Links in the description on how to join. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.